His name is Jesus, the man from Galilee. He lives. He lives. That same Jesus is living inside of me. He lives. He, lives. he woke me up this morning in my right mind. He lives. He, lives. he walks with me and he talks with me all the time. Oh. everyone I hope you enjoy this message today on this beautiful glorious Sunday remember that God is in control and everything that you do do it to God's glory don't forget to give we are appreciative of your giving and we want to come back to a church that's going to be open we want to come back to a building that will be open so we depend on your giving and we depend on you tune in and I pray the Lord will bless you with this word today to so, uh, talk to you this morning from first Peter Chapter 1, verse 17 through 23, uh, and I'm taking this from the New Revised Standard Version. It says, if you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways you inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have general mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. I want to talk to you today from the subject, holy sanitizer, holy sanitizer. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, do you have some holy sanitizer? <laughs> do you have some holy sanitizer? Well, since the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been hearing recommendations on how to minimize catching and spreading the disease. These recommendations kept being modified because experts refuse to confess that they do not understand the nature of the virus. It was on Friday, February 7th, at an executive press conference on national TV uh, that we heard coming from the podium, the coronavirus would weaken when we get into April because the warmer weather has a negative effect on that type of virus. Well, here we are, almost two months now on lockdown, and April is almost over, and the virus has not weakened but grew stronger. And I've concluded that in a nutshell, when you refuse to confess that you do not understand the nature of what is trying to kill you, you will put everyone around you in jeopardy. Th that is why uh, we have to understand the nature of sin. Because you have an adversary called the devil who, that is invisible to the eye, seeking whom he may devour, trying to kill you and everyone around you. Even Paul had to recognize that he didn't fully understand the nature of sin uh, when he said, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do, and what I actually do, I hate to do. Uh, so two months later, this invisible virus is still killing people. And the strange thing about not calling out the devil for who he is, a stealer, a killer, and a destroyer, uh, in response, the devil uh, shifts 
blinded eyes to focus on everybody else but him. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a manipulator. Uh, and multiple times in the month of March, March 4th and March 13th to be exact, it was said from an executive briefing uh, that it was the previous administration's fault for not having anything in place to combat this virus. Oh, my, ch my, my brothers and sisters, when you refuse to call out the root of the problem, you begin to blame other people for your situation. Man, I'm trying to help somebody in here. Uh, this situation is not for man to fix, but it's for collaborative mind of Christ to fix. But when you have a narcissistic God complex that you are the savior and you want to take credit for the things God is doing, then Satan has you where he wants you to. Oh, and, 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 I, I, I just, and God says, he says, I want you to hear me, my brothers and my sisters, if my people, which who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. And while we've been saying this scripture, it's a cute phrase, a catchphrase, uh, it, it almost now has become like a cliche, but now is the time to see who really believes in the word. If you believe in the word of God, you got to take him at his word. The most powerful weapon is obedience and prayer. The Bible says that the prayers of the righteous, not the raggedy, availeth much. Are you obedient in praying? Are you obedient in your giving? Uh, it's easy to be obedient when you're at church because other people are watching you. Mm -hmm. It's harder to be obedient at your house watching via YouTube because no one sees you. So is your obedience to God predicated on folks watching you give? Or is it predicated on God's instructions? Help me, God. Because if our obedience to give is predicated only when other folks are watching or only when I come to a building, but then what does it say about our obedience in our own personal life? I, I, I'm here to ask you, are you obedient in your giving? I want to come back to a church where I don't have to complain or ask people for my. I want to come back because I knew I was talking to an obedient group of people. No one should have to, have to pump you up and convince you to give. God says, this is how you become obedient to me. Well, are you obedient in worship? Are you only able to shout when you hear a song sung? by someone you like, someone you approve of, someone you know. Uh, but are you able to get into the spirit and, and worship God even with a song that's foreign to you, even if a person has done you wrong? And this is a level of your own spiritual maturity to do a litmus test to see where you measure up. Or do we have the wherewithal to shout off of a word that is not attractively packaged? See, many people end up with the wrong spouse because they fell in love with the package, not the person. Because they were dressed nice and they were popular, they had a little bit of money, they were easy pick. Everybody around you said, yeah, that's the one. Everybody convinced you, yeah, you need to get married to him. You need to get married to her. That's the person that you need to be around. But the one who was smart, the one who didn't have the best clothes, maybe not the most polished, uh, was left by the wayside. Some of y'all can relate. And now 20 years later, you figured out, I made a mistake. Don't get so caught up in the package that you miss God's provision. Uh, help me, God, here. Uh, are you obedient to his word? And are you obedient in your reverence to him? Uh, the, uh, the plans of the heart belong to the man, but the answer of the tongue comes from God. Uh, everyone has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. And the virus has punched the world in its mouth. And the question is, will the children of God step up and get with God's plan? 
And it, the, the Bible says even the foolish plan of God is wiser than humans' plans. And even God's weaknesses are stronger than the greatest of human strength. So the world has been doing what they want, when they want, and treating people how they want. And, and, and they've been doing it, and some of God's people have been participating in the process. And God says, I want a people that's going to transform to my will. Because God's will is perfect and we must transform so that we may discern his perfect will. So in our text this morning, the children of God are going through an adjustment to their spiritual and identity formation. What Peter is encouraging them to do is to prepare their minds, souls, and bodies to face whatever foe presents themselves. Whether it could be economic, political, legal, racial, and contextually, me adding, viral, it's vital that they get ready. The Christians in 1 Peter uh, were facing issues because they were forced into social distancing because of their Christian distinctiveness. Help me, God. Oh, my God. Uh, they, uh, you ever been forced into social distancing because of your Christian distinctiveness? Uh, let me help you out here. Because you believe in God, people don't want to talk to you. Uh, your neighbors don't want to deal with you because you, uh, they, they have a view of you. They don't really know you. They just know the package. They don't know the person. And, and when it comes down to it, the very person that you may need might have the provision to fix their package. Help me, God, here. Oh, uh, and, and Peter, uh, and, and since they got saved in 1 Peter, the people of God, they did not participate in the things that, that the world was participating in. They, they stopped going to the places they used to go. They stop, stop associating with behavior that was detrimental to their Savior. Uh -huh. and, and Peter, they were down and out. They were like, man, we, we're at social distancing. Uh, we, we, uh, people looking at us weird. We even getting talked to badly. And Peter sends the word of God to them saying, in order to live properly in this new life, you must abandon your old life and you must live in a reverent fear of God. All right. Uh, somebody said live in a reverent fear of God. All right. That, you didn't say it. Live in a reverent fear of God. Thank you. All right. Uh, reverent fear is not about being scared. Uh, reverent fear is having a deep respect for God. Uh, it's a submission to God. The Lord is my helper. Whom shall I fear? Mm, help me, God. See, when you live in reverent fear, the fear of the world, the fear of man, the fear of your employer does, doesn't take over you. Reverent fear is the fear that conquers all other fears. Help me, God, here. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and my people die for a lack of knowledge. So fear is the beginning of wisdom, and wisdom comes from above. The fear of the Lord in, in, in Negroes, it, it gives us righteousness and faithful service. I don't have to fear being laid off. Not, I don't have to fear all these things, for I learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it's like to have plenty, but I have learned the secret of being content in every situation that whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in war, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on somebody you know you need to get up and say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and behold Yahweh's eye is on those who fear him, on those who he has his loving kindness. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should I feel lonely in the heavens and his home when Jesus is my portion a constant friend is he his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me so I sing because I'm happy and I sing because I'm free for his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me uh, so ain't no need to worry what the night's going to bring. 
because it'll be all over. Yeah, there you go. Uh, in the morning. Uh, so I, I need to live in reverent fear. Uh, but not only do I need to live in a reverent fear, but I need to recognize my redemption. Somebody said, recognize your redemption. Uh, so back in 2000, the year 2000, a 23-year-old man named Cornelius Anderson III, uh, nickname, he goes by Mike, uh, he was arrested for robbing a Burger King at gunpoint. He was sentenced to 13 years in prison. Uh, he was released on bail and told to await orders on when to show up to serve his time. Uh, the orders never came, and due to a clerical error, Mike never went to prison, help me Jesus. But instead of using his freedom to commit more crimes, Mike started his own construction business, became a youth football coach, and volunteered at his local church. He also got married, he had three children, and became a well-liked member of his community. 13 years later, the state discovered their error and immediately put Mike behind bars. For nearly one year, Mike was behind bars. And as the case received international coverage, an online petition for his release gained more than 35,000 signatures. After a court hearing lasted a mere, after a court hearing that lasted a mere 10 minutes, the judge conceded that Mike was a changed man and granted him credit for the years he should have been in prison. As tears fell from Mike's eyes walking out of the courthouse, his wife and his family embraced him. And while composing himself, he told reporters, I was guilty. I should have served in prison, but I thank God I'm redeemed. Oh my God, uh, how many of you, due to a clerical error, skip judgment? Oh, I'm not talking to anybody in here. Oh, I see you right now. Uh, due to grace, you didn't become pregnant when you had that slip up. I got you right there on the couch. How many times due to his mercy, you avoided embarrassment when your picture could have been exposed on Instagram? Oh, uh, they didn't have Instagram back then, but Christ, uh, Christ's naked picture was put on a phone, but it, it was put on a body. It was put on a tree. It was put on a cross for everyone to see. They didn't have it on a phone, but they had them up in the sky for everyone to see. And while we would have cried in embarrassment, while watching everyone look at our exposed self, he took the chastisement, my God. He took the embarrassment for our redemption. He took the embarrassment for our release. Oh, so I give God the praise because I recognize my own redemption. I recognize what it cost. It cost him something, not perishable like money, but it cost him his precious blood. So God, I thank you for letting me skip judgment, embarrassment, and I recognize my redemption. Because every time I think about the blood that was shed for me way back on Calvary, that blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. So I am to live in reverent fear. I am to recognize my redemption. But I am also renewed by Christ's revelation. Say, are you renewed by Christ's revelation? In 1 Peter, the children of God we're all waiting to get back to business as normal. The fact of the matter is God was doing a shift within society and life uh, and they didn't go back to normal. Uh, they were going into a new normal. Hmm. Uh, they were going into a new season, uh, an uncharted territory. God revealed himself to Noah and told him to prepare for the flood. God spoke to Noah. 
God revealed himself to Noah. And while they were on their journey, locked in a boat, God was disciplining their hearts for patience. And after 40 days, when the flood subsided, Noah had to step out into a world different than what he was used to. Watch this. The first thing that he did after leaving the ark was build an altar. Mm. He made up in his mind that as soon as I get out of this mess, I'm going to bless God for sparing my life. Oh, help me, God. Uh, when the Israelites were in bondage, God revealed himself to Moses. God spoke to Moses. God revealed himself to Moses while they were on their journey through the wilderness. God was disciplining them to be a new people, to, uh, to enter the land of promise. Moses was able to see the land, but Joshua had to step out into a different world than what he was used to. Watch this. The first thing that Joshua did after conquering the land was to build an altar. Because he made up in his mind that as soon as I get out of this mess, I'm going to bless God for sparing my life. When you were in a flood, when you were in bondage, God spoke to you. God says, I'm not going to let you drown. I'm not going to keep you enslaved. And, and, some, you know, and some people just don't understand why I give God the glory, why I'm not, I'm not always phased by criticism. I'm not always phased by who's doing what and X, Y, and Z, because I understand that, and that the reason why I give God the praise is because even when I get in situations that are over my head, he guides me. When I, I, when, when I feel like I'm trapped and enslaved in, in a job or something that he finds me. I am renewed by Christ's revelation. All it took was a flashback for, for you to remember how God got you out of that situation and how he spoke to you. But when you were struggling and you came to church, sat there, didn't even listen, but God spoke to you while you were there, you missed 90% of the service, but that 10% was for you and God blessed you. So when you're living on your own and you lost your job and no one really to call too embarrassed to ask your friends but God revealed himself to you and he said young man young woman old woman old man you're better than this I got you and that's the reason why I shout the way I shout that's the reason why I give him the glory because it has nothing to do with other people do, do me a favor and tell the person around you I'm renewed by his revelation he spoke to me he talked to me I should have been left there on the street because I was rebellious stubborn and wanted to do my own thing but God spoke to me he spoke to me Christ revealed himself to me and sometimes God doesn't always have to come in a vision or have to shake mountains or move he speaks in that quiet voice and you just get this internal encouragement or you hear confirmation from your Bible from the word from the preacher from the song selection from the from the usher from whoever it is from your house your spouse God speaks to you he reveals himself to you and aren't you glad that he revealed himself to you when you were down and out and you can see your way out I want you to give God the glory. He deserves the glory. Why are you playing with? Give him the glory. Oh, hallelujah. He said, if you won't praise me, the rocks will cry out. Oh, I'm not going to wait until I get to heaven to shout. I'm going to give him glory and be on obedience with him. Oh, so I, we got all these standards now. We don't understand this virus. Uh, and I was looking at some hand sanitizer, and you know not all hand sanitizer is the same. Uh, you can get some that can't do anything. But effective hand sanitizer is 40% water, 60% alcohol, and 1% fragrance. Its purpose is to clean and to purify your hands when soap and water are not available. It, it, it cleans, help me, and kills what is hidden on the surface. So what's on the surface doesn't kill what's underneath the surface. Yeah, okay, I'm not even going to do that. Uh, you, you can't see it, but it kills it. it uh, water, alcohol, 
and a touch of fragrance. That, that, that's what hand sanitizer is. Uh, um, water is the base. Alcohol has the power. And the fragrance is pleasing to the nostril. Oh, help me, Jesus. Uh, might I suggest to you today that the water is the spirit, that alcohol is the power of God, and the fragrance is the praise. See, and when you put them together in right proportions, you have a solution of holy sanitizer. Help me, Jesus. Somebody help me. Uh, give me a little squirt of that. Uh, when you have a holy sanitizer, it clears the junk trying to kill you and it purifies your heart. Uh, I, I, the, the evidence that you are clean, uh, that you have been changed, that your hands are no longer dirty, is the love that you have for one another. If you get hurt, use some of the holy sanitizer. If you uh, feel like you've been depressed, use some of the holy sanitizer. If your soul is in danger, look above. Jesus completely says he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. The billows will obey. He's your savior. You want him to be. Be saved today. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Me. All you gotta do is give me a little squirt, squirt and I will live in reverence. I will recognize my redemption and I will rejoice in his re revelation. And then I will allow myself to have the holy sanitizer and God will purify my soul and give him love. Come on and give him the glory. Hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised.